Okay. Um, Earl, can I give you this? Yeah. I've seen that before. I was going to say, I have a table over here if that's easier. This means that this, you're signing this, you're agreeing that it's a voluntary <clears throat> statement. I just want to say one word at the beginning about the Please voluntary, do. just so I want to make sure, just for our portion. Yep. Yeah. But he's, he can leave at any time. That's all I'm going to say. Is he, he's a voluntary statement. Yeah. He can leave at any time. We've agreed okay. to give a we've agreed to give a statement to the BCA about okay. the conduct. We've not agreed to give a statement to the FBI that's investigating right. the civil rights. All right. I, and I'm not going to interject. I appreciate uh, being here. So anytime that you want to say something, just say. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, so I shouldn't ask him any. I mean, you're going to object if I ask him questions. Yeah. I just want to get it. Okay. We're okay, though. Yep. Let's okay. go. Can Can you put that on into the recording? Yeah, we're going to. So. Why is this room? Why are we in this room? Because typically we do it at the agency. And so we don't have um, a, a ton we're of. Not, uh, we're not set six up. Six foot away from you. We're not set up <laughs> for it. <laughs> we're, we're, Go ahead. So okay. So let's just. We're, we're going to try to run this like we typically run these, sure. right? Um, I'm just going to identify everybody in the room here for the record, okay? Um, so today's date is May 31st, 2020. Time is 13:15 hours. This is Special Agent Brent Peterson with the BCA. Our case number is 2020338. Uh, also present is Special Agent Michelle Frasconi from the BCA, Special Agent Kevin Kane with the FBI, uh, Attorney Earl Gray, and Attorney Kevin Gray. And a law clerk. Law, okay, law clerk. Thank you. Law clerk Kevin Gray. And then it's it's Thomas Lane, is that correct? That's yes, right. Okay. Um, can I just get Thomas, do you go by Thomas or Tom, or what would you prefer, Mr. Uh, Tom, Lane? We really go by the okay. Mr. Lane or what, What's your middle name, Thomas? Kiernan, A-I-E-R-N-A-N. -E All right, and then Lane is L-A-N-E? L-A-N-E. All right, thank you. And what's a birthday for you, sir? March 8th, 1983. All right. Is there an address we could get for you? You need it? Not an address right now. I can't make you do anything. I'm just yeah. going to ask if you don't want to give it to us. Hello, is Ramsey County? Yeah. Uh, how about a telephone number? I don't want to give that out. Sounds good. All right. So um, before we started here, I presented you, uh, your attorney, um, with what's called the criminal investigation warning form. You had an opportunity to go over that and, um, with your attorney. So just so it's clear, you're, you're here voluntarily. Um, you are not under arrest. You're not going to be arrested. Um, we are here to take a voluntary statement from you. Is that is that accurate? Yes. Is that your understanding? Yes. Right here? Okay. And are you good talking to us about what happened that day? Yes. Okay. Um, it's kind of also been stated that any questioning from the FBI will you will not be answering questions from them. Is that that's correct? Clear. Okay. Yes. Understood. It's a different investigation in our belief than the investigation you're conducting. So, did you want to put something on the record? No, I, no. <clears throat> Go ahead. No, you handle it appropriately. I was just wondering if you're open to the possibility after this of sitting down and having a completely separate interview. With no, not unless we know the questions ahead of time. Okay, I'm sure that that can be worked out between you and Mr. Paul. So yes, okay. Jeff and I know each other. Okay. okay. Well, let's just start then um, with, with kind of how, how we do this. We just want to learn a little bit about your background to begin. Um, just, I guess, can you just tell us uh, what your educational experience is um, post high school? Do you have a college degree? I do. I uh, went to Century Community College for a couple of years, all four years actually. Um, I ended up getting an uh, associate's degree from there, and then I transferred to the University of Minnesota where I got um, a Bachelor of Science degree in Sociology of Law, Criminology, and Deviance with an emphasis in Policy and Policy. Okay, and what year did you get your degree from? Uh, I believe it was 2016. Okay, 2016. 
Um, when did you, let well, me ask, do you have any military no. experience, a veteran or anything like that? No. Okay. Um, how long total have you, or were you in law enforcement? Um, as in the process or working, what, what is? From start to finish, like when did you first, did you have any prior experience no. to Minneapolis? No. Yes. Okay. So Minneapolis Police Department <coughs> was your sole agency yes. you worked for. When did you start? I was hired uh, February, the end of February in 2019. 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 so what, can you just explain that cadet process to us? Um, I went for five weeks of uh, theory training at Century College. Uh, from there, I went to the Hennepin County Technical College, HCC, for the skills portion of the training to get post license. Um, that was about five months. Uh, and then from there, I went to the Minneapolis Police Academy, uh, and that was about four months. Four months. Okay, and so prior, so when you're a cadet, are you a sworn licensed peace officer? No, okay. you're not sworn until you're um, until you graduate from the academy. Okay, can, can you tell us about the academy? A little more about the academy experience. Um, you said it's four months. What does that encompass in those four months? Um, physical training, hands-on training, defensive tactics training, weapons training, um, educational policy. You know statutes and stuff like that, geography, um, departmental mm -hmm. uh, knowledge. So when you're done with the police academy, what happens? Uh, you start the field training process, okay. FTO, um, and that's approximately four, four months, four and a half. What is that? What does the FTO process kind of mean? Like, what do you do in the FTO process? FTO process, you ride with the training officer. Um, the training officer um, goes to calls with you, and you work through the calls together, as a, typically as a squad. So uh, when you first start on FTO, are you taking calls and you're being evaluated, well, actually, or is it kind of a graduated there was a There was an orientation period, I forgot, that was immediately after the academy, where you, uh, you spent like a week in dispatch, or a couple days in dispatch, a couple days with investigations, yeah. and then uh, three weeks of orientation, which was just you were riding with an officer and then they were just kind of showing you how stuff works. You weren't really expected to do um, a lot of hands on at police and stuff like that. Are you in uniform and all you're that? You're still in uniform and you fully, you know, like everything you sworn. Um, it's just more for kind of understanding the process and getting used to the radio mm -hmm. and the computers and um, just you know, turning the radio on and off and locking the doors. And so are you, are you assigned uh, the same field training officer for the entire process, no. or do you? And, uh, for my orientation period, I kind of had a few different people that I would ride with. Mm -hmm. um, but then for once you start the actual FBO process, um, I had one officer the first month, a different officer the second month, and then for the final two months, I had one officer. Um, okay. I, so I had three field training officers in the course. So that first month, what area of the city were you? Downtown. Downtown. What hours? What shift? That was power shift. What? So four or eight eight p.m. to I don't know what was it? Power shift gets done at four a.m. six to four. Okay, so downtown command from for that first month of your yeah. field training, and then the four. second month you go to a different precinct, or I went. Yeah, I mean, if everyone's schedule and how where they went was different, but I went to third precinct for that for that second month. Okay. What shift were you working on second month? I was working dog watch. Dog watch? 8 to 6 a.m. All right. And then the final two months? I was on dog watch. In the third precinct? Yep. Understood. And then at the end of your FTO training, is there like an evaluation period? A 10 day period, yeah. What is that? Uh, you do 10 shifts as an ABLE squad where your FTO um, basically just rides on and doesn't, you can't ask them any questions. They don't do anything. Just the there is like back up for you. Uh, you handle all the calls, you work the radio, the computer, you drive, you do everything. Okay. Is your FTO in a uniform? Yep. For that 10 day? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> but you can't use them as a resource yeah. unless it's something, an emergency or something. There, are, yeah, there's there only for safety. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's you're, you're supposed to think of it like you're riding alone. So, did you successfully complete the field training process at Yes. Process? When did you finish your 
ten day evaluation. You have a it was the Wednesday before uh, this incident we're gonna talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in May, mid May here. Yeah, I'm not sure the exact yeah. Okay. So so then um you finished the ten day mm -hmm. that Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Memorial Day was Monday. Yeah, it was. It was, it was the Wednesday prior yeah. to the. Okay, great. Um, so you've been signed off. You're good to go on solo patrol at that point. Yep. Um, can you just describe for us um, when you're on patrol what your uniform looks like? Just kind of start from head to toe. Describe it. You wear your vest. Under, I would wear it underneath my shirt. You got your blue shirts, um, your work pants, work boots, your belt, your duty belt, badge, nameplate, um, belt pad. Okay. You know, your duty belt has all your everything on it. What's on your duty belt? Um, you have mace, taser, handcuffs, radio, two sets of handcuffs, um, your service weapon, uh, key. I have my squad key on there. Um, uh, what kind of handgun do you are you issuing? CP320 is the one that I have three options. That's one. Is that a 99? Yeah. Okay. Um, in that uniform, clearly identifiable as a police officer? Yep. Okay. Like patches on your shoulder. And um, as far as your training in the academy, I guess, um, what are some are there some specific topics that are covered in training? I mean, obviously there's firearms and there's use of force, but do you take courses in like, are you, do you have to go through like crisis intervention or anything like that? Um, yeah, I believe there's some resources in that. I, I, I don't know about crisis intervention, that term specifically, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, we had scenarios with people, emotionally disturbed people. Oh, okay. Of thing. And like de-escalation mm -hmm. and techniques. Yep. Um, are you issued a body worn camera? Yep. Oh yeah, body camera. Where do you usually keep I would, that on your person? Right in the front center on my butt line. Okay. And w kind of what's what's the understanding about the body worn camera and when it's supposed to be activated, deactivated? Um, you don't have to quote for me like the policy, but just generally your understanding of when you're supposed to. Uh, two blocks before you arrive for call, and then deactivation, I guess, um, varies. Okay. Um, do you know if your body one camera was activated on the date that we're going to talk about? No, okay. Have you had an opportunity to see that video? I have. Okay. Um, when did you see that video? Um, I watched it after the incident, and then I just recently watched it again. So on the date of the incident, uh, or maybe it was the morning after you watched it, mm -hmm. where were you? In, in the squad car. In the squad car. Okay. Um, and then you just watched it again? Today, how many times today? Just once. Just once. And who was present with you? Okay. So uh, Mr. Mr. Gray and then Scott Miller <coughs> with the BCA. Okay. All right. Have you seen any other officers? No. Um, the squad car you were in that day. Did that have a recording device in it? It does. It has an MBR, yeah, okay. which records the front and the back seat. Do you know if that was activated? That was not activated. Okay. Typically, I. How does that work? How does the MVR or the... MVR is work? anytime the lights and sirens are activated, it kicks on, and you can also press a button to turn it on. Okay. Put, put someone in the back. Okay, understood. Um, what did the squad car look like that you were in? It's a fully marked squad 320. Light bar on top? Fully marked, yep. Okay. Light bar, light bar. No. no question that's a Minneapolis Police Department yeah. vehicle. No. Okay. Um, so you haven't been on very long, so the, the, the use of force training and firearms training, that was all done at the academy? Yes, sir. Okay. My dad. Please. Um, Chauvin was one of the trainers. In what way? <coughs> he was a field training officer. Was he your field training officer? No. Okay. Was he a trainer at the academy as well? No. Like, did he have a topic that he trained? No. Okay. Well, you had contact with him before the state, correct? Yes. I had, uh, 
You want me to get into yeah. that? Okay, so um, he was one of the other training officers in the precinct that I worked in. Um, he trained another officer that was in training as well. And I would, um, well, as I said, with the 10-day process, when you're when you're going doing that, you're an able squad. You can't ask your FTO, but you can ask other officers on scene, or you can call other officers and ask them questions on best practices for handling a call, mm -hmm. remind you know, making sure you're not forgetting anything. Um, so I, I had interaction with Chauvin before um, to the incident, and uh, you know, he giving me guidance on how to handle certain calls. So you kind of use it's a, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you used him as a resource during your 10-day evaluation. Yeah, there was, there was a few calls where um, I was with another training officer and he um, had given me advice on how to best handle a call and best handle a situation. Was he the only person that you... Um, there was other um, officers, you know, I mean, I had phone numbers that I called other officers and I didn't um, necessarily have Chauvin's number, but I, he was someone that I talked to for advice on a couple of calls okay. during my tenure for and, and prior. Did you work with him though pretty regularly during that um, time in the third precinct? Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't say like regularly because it's, I mean, it depends on the day. Sometimes you'll see a lot of officers on a call and sometimes you won't see someone. It mm -hmm. depends on what kind of call to go to, but I would have interaction with him and would see him on calls. Okay. Well, he was your partner's field training officer, right? He was. He was King's uh, training officer. Officer King? Yep. Understood. Okay. Um, how about outside of work? You and Officer Shaman socialized and okay. So your experience with him was a strictly kind of professional. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. okay. Understood. Well, thank you for that. Um, we may talk about that a little bit more here sure. too. Um, what what we're largely interested in now is kind of hearing what happened. Okay. Um, this happened on Monday the twenty fifth. That was a Memorial Day. Um, I guess just tell us in your own words with as much detail as possible what happened from your perspective. Okay. Um, we were dispatched to a forgery in progress report um, at the Cup Foods. Um, I believe in the call notes it said that the suspect was still on scene in a Mercedes. Um, and I, they might have given a caller, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, we drove to the call, we didn't activate our lights and sirens just because I believe we were relatively close and um, we got there and uh, entered the building, um, entered Cup Foods, the business. There was a, a staff member there that said, you know, they're still here. He goes, he was holding a bill and he goes, they gave me this, it's a fake 20. They're, he pointed across the street and they're like, he's, it's, he's in the car over there, you know, go get him before he drives off. Um, so I said, you know, and he started walking out and I was like, you know, just head back in, we'll take care of it. Um, me and King walked across the street. There was a vehicle I could see that was occupied three times. It was a blue Mercedes. Um, there was um, Mr. Floyd was in the front seat, and then there was a male in or in the driver's seat. There was a male in the front passenger seat, and then I didn't I could see I didn't know who it was, but it turned out it was a female in the back passenger seat. Uh, as I was walking across the street to get to the vehicle, um, I could see the front seat passenger look back and see us, and I, I believe the driver as well looked back um, and they both started kind of digging underneath the seat, which uh, looked like they were reaching for something. Um, and I said that to King, I said they're moving around quite a bit as I was coming across the street. Mm -hmm. um, I walked up to the driver's side of the vehicle, I knocked on the glass, um, and the driver was sitting with his hand down below the seat, kind of leaning forward like this, and I said, let me see your other hand. And I directed him, let me see your other hand. Um, he didn't do that. And he was just, you know, oh, it's not a big deal or whatever. And he kept his hand down there. Um, and he just you know, glanced back. So I took my gun out and, you know, and I said, let me see your, your other fucking hand. Put your hand up. Um, gave him commands to do that. Uh, I'm not sure how many. I think I gave a few. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why, but he quickly went like this, like pulled his hand out real fast. And I kind of like took a step back and was like, Jesus, you know, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, and I directed him to put his hands on the wheel. He did. Um, I think he had opened the door initially too. I didn't open it, but he had, he had opened it and kind of started to step out. And I was like, no, like, what are you doing? Um, so 
once he had his hands up there, I put my gun away, and I was telling him, you know, put your hands on top of your head. Um, we've been trained uh, in the academy that, you know, when you get someone out of the vehicle, you have them put your hands on your head, you grab the top of their hands, and you have them step out and face away from you, and then you can handcuff them from there. Um, he wasn't really complying with that or was just, you know, saying, oh, I, you know, I got shot like this or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I then went to grab his hand and then help, you know, pull him out of the vehicle because I could see that he was, as he was sitting like this with his hands up, he kind of was looking down at the steering wheel or looking down at the keys. And I was concerned that he was going to try and take off, uh, drive away in the vehicle. So um, I kind of pulled him out. Uh, while he was doing that, he started trying to turn around, so I pushed him forward into the door frame, which is another thing we were taught to do if someone's not complying. Um, King came around, uh, and he, you know, was trying again to kind of turn around on me, and I was, you know, just trying to keep him pinned in the door, so I didn't know, typically, if someone's trying to turn around and face you, they want to either, you know, run or punch you or do something, so um, King came around, and we ended up getting handcuffed at that point and uh then while we were kind of struggling with him to get him handcuffed he you know the other two passengers stepped out of the car uh, so i could see that that was happening so i walked around after he was after he was handcuffed i walked around to the other side and told them you know step up against the wall drop the bag we need to figure out what's going on here and um officer king brought him brought uh, floyd around and had him sit on the sidewalk um, I had ID'd those two, um, the female said something about, like, he'd been shot like that before, that's why he was freaking out, um, because I pulled the gun on him, and I said, well, you know, he has his hand down there, if I'm telling you to see your hand, let me see your hands, like, that you don't keep your hand hidden for any reason. Um, so basically, I ID'd those two, um, since we had three people and only us two officers I was like you know we should put him in the car we're going to get him secured I wanted to come back and search the car and try and figure out what was going on and why he was digging around or if there was something he was trying to hide under the seat and then get the other two people ID they seemed compliant so I was like just you know I told them stay there um so we walked Floyd across the street and um kind of he wasn't really he was kind of trying to, you know, drag his feet or, you know, I don't want to go in there, I'm not going in there, it's not, you know, it's not me, and uh, we got to the car, he was kind of pushing back when we were trying to um, search him, just because you have to search people before you put them in the back of your squad car. I believe when we were searching him, a park officer arrived, and um, I directed him, I could see the people kind of start walking, the two of people that we hadn't identified yet, they were by the car walking back towards the car, and I said, Watch the car, don't let them go anywhere, don't let them go back in the car, because I don't know what's in there. Um, uh, I believe it was at this time that King found a pipe on, in Floyd's pocket, and he handed it to me, and I set it up on top of the vehicle. Um, Floyd started to, we tried to get him to sit down in the car, and he said he was claustrophobic, don't put me in there, don't put me in there, we're like, dude, you need to get in the car, you need, we need to, you got to get secured in here, and we need to figure out what's going on. So, um, he kept saying no, he didn't want to get in there, he was refusing, he kept pushing back up, trying to get out, um, we were trying to push him in, I believe that's when the other squad, I'm not even sure what their call sign was that day, um, with the other two officers arrived. And, um, so, yeah, he said, you know, someone's got to stay with me. And I said, you know, he's like, I'm claustrophobic. I'm like, I'll roll the windows down. I'm going to stay in the car with you. That's fine. You know, I'll put the air on. Um, so then he still was refusing to get in the car. So I walked around to the other side and was going to pull since he was, his back was facing into this car. If this is like the door. Um, I was going to go around and try and pull his arm through the other side of the squad just to get him in there so we could close the doors and secure him. Um, when I went in, I walked around again to the other side. I went to pull him through. Um, he started really thrashing back and forth, and I think he was hitting his face on the, the glass that goes to the front seat. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the first time I saw that he was bleeding from the mouth. Um, 
So I went to pull him through. He kind of, I pulled him in to the car, and I think he either put his feet on the, the frame of the door or the something and pushed, and he was like kind of going. I was trying to pull him through, and then he started pushing with me, and he kind of came out the other side of the door um, and was kind of fighting back, you know, fighting with us, trying to trying to not go back into the squad. We kept trying to, you know, get him in there. Um, and um, from there, let's see, he, I think we tried to push him back in again, and it, he still was not complying with that. We ended up going down to the ground. Um, someone, I think someone said, you know, let's bring him to the ground, because he's just kind of completely, we can't control him. Um, we went down to the ground. Uh, King was next to me. Officer Chauvin was at the front end. And um, he was on his stomach, and we were basically just trying to restrain him. I think I said, let's use the MRT, or MR, I might have said it wrong, but the maximum restraint technique, which is um, what you use on someone who's handcuffed and not complying, that's physically resisting you while handcuffed. Mm -hmm. um, it's just basically where... You, it's like a hobble. You put a hobble on their legs and um, prevents them from kicking and doing that. Uh, so I was trying to get his legs into a leg cross where you cross the legs and push him up onto the butt just to keep him from kicking because he was kicking around at that point. Um, and then I think I had said to Tao, you know, or Maybe King had said something about getting the hobble, and I said, mine's in my bag, it's labeled. So he flipped the thing up and then <laughs> giving me a hobble. Um, from there, I was going to try and put it on, but it was basically, I think we had started EMS too at that point, or mm -hmm. I would said, let's start an ambulance um, for the mouth situation. And um, so that was code two, it hadn't stepped it up yet. And then we ended up not getting, I wasn't able to, or I didn't get the hobble on him, so we just kind of pinned him. I think someone had said, you know, let's just hold him here. We got an ambulance coming. Um, and then uh, he was still kind of fighting and moving around, so we just kind of held him there. And then, uh, I'm not sure if it was me, but someone, yeah, said, you know, let's, let's step the ambulance up to code three. I think I had said, I, you know, I felt like he was on drugs or something. He was just quite based on his behavior and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. What did you say about rolling him over? Yeah, I would said, I, based on, the, based on the, the drug thing, I was saying, you know, once he stopped actively kicking us, I was like, maybe we should roll him onto his side. I said, I think this might be, you know, an excited delirium situation. Um, which is something we had been told about in the academy, which is where uh, when someone is on drugs, they kind of work themselves up and they can end up having, you know, basically um, having issues from that. So, um, yeah, so from there we had the ambulance stepped up. Um, he, once he kind of stopped fighting us. I, I think I had said again, you know, I think we should roll him onto his side. Um, and I believe Chauvin said, you know, we have him, there's an ambulance coming, we got him, we're just going to hold here. Um, and that's made sense to me just because I've had experiences with people who are ODing or they'll be out one minute and they'll come back and really, you know, um, be aggressive with you. So I was like, all right, we got an ambulance coming, code three, we're just going to hold here until until the ambulance gets here. Um, so, yeah, and that seemed to make sense um, at the time. Um, so, um, I could, after he stopped kind of talking and yelling or whatever, I could see, I remember being able to look through and I could see his back right lat he was still, he was breathing. I, could, I was watching that, making sure that I could keep an eye on that, that he was still, um, he was still breathing. 
So I'm like, okay, he's just passed out. He's, you know, worked himself up, and now he's just kind of passed out. So I could see that. Um, I think at one point, um, he, you know, based just that he would stop moving, I, I had said something to King, like, you know, maybe check his pulse, see if you can find a pulse on him, just because um, he stopped moving for a while. And then, uh, then the ambulance came. Um, ambulance arrived. They pulled up. I think they came up and checked his pulse. Uh, and they said, you know, we're going to, they pulled the cart out, dropped the bag thing. I helped put him onto there. And then um, that got loaded up onto the stretcher and then we loaded into the ambulance. Uh, I asked them, I said, you know, do you want me to roll with you just for, just, just because he's detained and just in case they needed help with anything. He said, yeah. So I went there. Um, we basically were just going to pull down the block because there was kind of a crowd of people that were um, angry. So the ambulance just wanted to roll down around the block, around the corner, just out of the way. And um, I think at that point, some time point in the ambulance, I, I tried again to find a pulse on him. Um, I, I couldn't at that point. I thought he might be still breathing. I, I know I was working on keeping his airway open. Um, I asked EMS, you know, what do you, what do you need me doing? They said, you know, start chest comp, start CPR. So I started chest compressions. And um, obviously the CPR, you do chest compressions and then breathing. And I was like, do you want me to do, you know, 15 and hold the airway or try and do that? And he said, no, nope, just keep doing chest compressions. So um, I continued doing chest compressions until we parked. And then uh, the driver, who was the other EMS, EMT or whatever, he came around and started um, to get the Lucas machine ready, which is the CPR machine. And uh, from there, um, I helped them get this, the Lucas machine ready or get that applied. They were having some trouble getting it underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, and it kept trying, like, was going to clip into his skin. So I was trying to make sure that it just locked in like it's supposed to. Um, that locked in. That started. Uh, then they, I'm not sure what it's called, where they put the, like, intubate, I think. And they started oxygen. And, um, you know, I was asking again, what, what can I do to help? And he gave, uh, gave me the airbag and said, you know, every time the light lights up, just pump that get that going and uh as we were parked there then fire arrived they came in and i just kind of felt like the extra non-medical guy there so i was like do you guys need me in here and they're like we're good we got two fire and two ems mm -hmm. so um and i jumped out and went into was trying to see if i could get a ride back from um my partner but then one of the fire people on scene offered to me right back to the scene where um, where my squad was and my partner was. So, and so you went back to the scene? Yep. What happened from there? Um, from there, we basically talked to a sergeant was on scene. He said he was going to go down to the hospital. Um, Chauvin directed us that we should wait for the car, wait on the car. Um, the other guys, I think, I'm not sure where Chauvin and Tao went. I think they were going to go down to the hospital as well at that point. Um, but they were saying, you know, you guys pull your squad over here, park behind the vehicle, wait on the vehicle, because we still hadn't searched the vehicle, and we were unsure. Um, I don't know what happened to those other two people that were in the car. I'm not sure where they were. So. How long were you then at the scene? Um, it was a while. We were just basically waiting in the car. Okay. So waiting in the car, on the car. So you, all right. At some point, were you brought down to room 100? Yeah, and so then, about that process. yeah, we were waiting on the car. What happened to the pipe? The pipe was on top of, so, yeah, the pipe that I had been given and I put up on top of the squad was sitting on the squad, and I had forgotten about it. Um, so I drove the car from, you know, just basically across the street, and then I don't think I even realized it was there until Sergeant Edwards came. Mm -hmm. And when Sergeant Edwards came, I could see it on top of the car, and I was like, oh, crap. You know, I, that's been sitting up there this whole time, and I didn't even realize it. Okay. So um, then I got an envelope and put that in there. And uh, <clears throat> then I helped cordon off the scene, and I talked to a couple other people that they said, you know, if there's any witnesses or anyone wants to be added, do that. 
and I didn't get anyone's info on them once we got down to um, 100, then they said, you know, check your body came off and we had the interview, so I did that. Okay. Is it is it okay if I just clarify something? Yeah. You've said a lot, and I appreciate it. I, I just want to make sure that it's clear. Sure. Okay. Um, first of all, the, the, the location of the initial call. Yeah. Do you remember the name of that? Cup Foods. Had you been there before on calls? Um, I don't believe so. Not that store specifically. The intersection looks familiar. Okay. It's hard to say. I mean, we go to a lot of calls. Understood. Cup food. Cup. Not a cup. P. Yeah. Yeah, not a cup. Yep. Not cub. So mm -hmm. you were squad what was 320. So what, what does that mean? Like, what area of the 3rd Precinct are you kind of responsible for? Uh, Lake Street down to 40. 42nd. Lake Street and south then, to 42nd. Yeah, and then uh, Hiawatha west to the freeway. Hiawatha west to the freeway. East. Okay. Maybe, yeah. East or west? No, it'd be west. Yeah. Be west. Okay. I got you. Okay. Everything east of Hiawatha is 340. And so who was your, who was your partner that night? Then? King. What's Officer he? King. Officer King. Okay. And he, same amount of time on as you? Uh, I think he finished on Friday, Was so he had two days on, or I had like one more day. One okay, day so roughly about the same. Yeah. All right. Is it common to partner um, officers right out of training together? I don't know. Have you seen it before? Um, I've heard of it, yeah, I think. Okay. That might be something they do. And I think they, they try and, they said they want to put newer officers together just because. Sure, okay. Um, and the commanders make those decisions. You don't. We don't. Yeah, we just get assigned when we walk in. They say, "This is who you ride with today." Okay. And that's where it so, how many times have you ridden with King? That was the only time. That was the first time, right? Okay. Um, did you know him though? I mean, I knew him from the academy. Okay. Um, so, this particular call, how did it come in? It came in as a forgery in progress. Forgery in progress. Okay. Have you? Handled forgery or counterfeit money calls before yeah. on training? Mm -hmm. Not on training. I, well, yeah, on my FTO period. Yeah. And then, okay, how how typically do you handle those types of calls? Just generally. Go there, um, get a description of the person that handed off as much information as you can for them, mm -hmm. the nature of the interaction, how it went down, uh, value stuff. In in your you know, short time with the police department on FTO going to calls like similar to this. Has it been common that you've encountered the actual suspect no. at these forgeries? How has it typically gone in your experience? They, someone gave me this fake money, I realized it, and they left, or they got into an argument with someone and then the person left. So is it just kind of a report call for the most yeah. part? You'll take a report, collect the evidence, and move on with life? Yep. Yeah. So this one was this, this one was different? Yeah. yeah that he was there okay so what was the as you guys are going to this call first of all were you directly dispatched this call or i believe so yeah okay so well, you're... uh i, I want to say it was a dispatch it's i mean it's you, you do so much of like dispatch and then self-assign and okay we might have self-assigned to it on that would this particular address be in your assigned like your patrol district that yeah. 320 area yeah. okay so it's your responsibility to take care of this call in this yeah. particular this area. Is our call. you didn't like jump it from another no no no, no. understood yeah, it's, okay. it was in our district all right um when the call came out where do you remember where you were when you north approximate intersection five six seven blocks north not too far not too far. okay routine response we just rolled there. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you and Officer King discuss kind of what, how you're going to handle this call as you're driving there? And mm. if so, what was kind of the plan? I think just the basic, you know, we'll go there and see what what the deal is, and if the guy's still on scene, you know, yeah, take him into custody and, okay. and figure out what we got. Kind of the standard. There's a crime committed. Yep. Who did it? Mm -hmm. Detain him. Who? How do you determine who's going to be the contact and who isn't? Which officer is going to contact and which isn't? Uh, that was something we had, were talking about earlier, just that whole process, because we're not really used to that, working the contact cover. Typically, the guy who's the driver is the cover, 
and the guy who's the passenger is the contact, mm -hmm. meaning they do all the interaction, they mm -hmm. work the radio, they work the computer, they write the reports. Okay. But like I said, we, we've never rolled together. I've never, that was only the second time working actually a squad with another officer. Okay. Out of that field. Who My first. Understood. Who was driving? I was. Okay. So in that scenario, Officer King would possibly, by default, be sitting in the passenger seat, be the, con the contact officer? Yeah. Is it kind of fluid? I mean, is it a hard and fast rule, or do you just no? Know? I mean, it's okay. It, yeah, like it, you can bounce back and forth, and it's kind of like I said, we were talking about even mm -hmm. how to do it because we don't, we haven't really had any practice with. You know, I think on one of the other calls, he was talking to someone, and then I asked some questions, and then we're like, oh, that's right. You know, we gotta try and remember to be contact, cover, like mm -hmm. remember our roles. And, mm -hmm. But okay, just learning it still yeah 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 okay. we had we were trying to figure out the best way to do it uh, all right. works. so um when you pull up to cup foods where do you park right in front we parked pulled up basically on what street uh chicago facing south in the northbound lane. okay okay gotcha um can you just you walk into the store tell us what you're told at that point the guy came walking over, he had a bill in his hand. He said, you know, he gave me a fake bill, that's that's the guy over there. Um, you know, go get him before he, he drives away. Okay, it, real quick yeah. statement from him. Did you look at the bill? I didn't. No. Did, did you ever collect it later or anything like that? I think it was, I'm not sure. But you didn't do that I and you haven't no. seen it? No. Okay. So him telling you it was counterfeit was essentially... I think that calling in and yeah. then the fact that there was someone still on scene. Um, we were more concerned with at least detaining that person, person on the suspicion of passing a counterfeit bill, and then figuring out the validity of the bill. What level of like what level of crime is passing a counterfeit um, bill? I want to say that that's a gross misdemeanor. misdemeanor. Okay. Is it a felony? It is felony or a yeah. felony. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Was there any indication about any sort of weapon or force or anything in the call? Like, what did you Nothing, know in no, the call? No. The Secret Service take counterfeit bills very serious. Oh. <laughs> As you, when the call comes out, like, what what is? Are you told anything other than just? There it, wasn't. There wasn't any indication. I don't think of weapons, as far as I could remember, or any force used. Was there in the call any information that the suspect was still on scene? Yeah. Okay. It's a, I mean, it came out as a forgery in progress, as in the person is still there. So you were not surprised when the, the gentleman working there pointed out and said that? No. Okay. I was, I guess I was expecting them to be in the store. Do you have any recollection approximately what time it was when you got to the store the first time? No. I, some people remember those things. Right? I'm not one of those. No, okay. Was it light or dark outside? It was like light still. You could see okay? Yeah. You were lying okay? Yeah. Um, so you approach the vehicle, and Officer King goes on the passenger side, is that right? Yep. Okay. I think, yeah, I mean, we just kind of crossed the street, and I was, got in front of King, and I was watching the car, and like I said, I could see some of them moving yeah. around, or they kind of saw us, and that's yeah. when I said to him, like, you know, something's going on, they're moving around, they can see us. All right, so the, as you approach the car, and you see um, Mr. Floyd there reaching. What what is what did that mean to you when you saw him reaching? What was the concern there? Uh, the concern was either that he was trying to stash something or he possibly had a gun. The, the, in my limited experience, I've been told that a lot of times people hide guns under their seats or, you know, that's where you're going to hide stuff that you don't want on you. You're going to put it underneath the seat, in between the seat, okay. under a floor panel or something. Have you experienced that, though, on the street? We're doing FTO, we're covering guns or drugs from underneath um, cars. Look, looking for them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we haven't. I found a BB gun under mm -hmm. in the wheel well of a thing, of a vehicle. Um, mm -hmm. But no, that's we just kind of were trained that that's typically you know people hide stuff in you know, some crannies under the. So when that was happening and you're walking up and you're seeing this, what what are you feeling at that point? I'm wondering what he's doing and want to know where his other hand is going and you know what's in his hand, I guess, basically. Okay. 
Um, he sees me coming, sees the police coming, and then starts reaching. It's like I said, it's either he's going to get something or he's going to put something away. Okay. That's what I was thinking. So how come you drew your gun then? Uh, because I asked him to see his other hand and he kept his hand like this. Mm -hmm. He had his one hand up and then he kept his hand down here and I said, let me see your other hand. Let me see your hand and he didn't. So I don't know if he's got a gun right there and he's just waiting to go like this or mm -hmm. what he's doing. What other observations of the inside of the car did you make in that kind of brief moment there, if you recall? Not, not much. I mean, just see there were other people in the car. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, I didn't. I think I re yeah I realized there was uh, someone in the back seat as well, and that kind of I didn't really like that just because I don't know who they are or what they're doing. And Could you see clearly into the back seat of the car? No. Okay. It was tint. I mean, it was a tinted window. Like I said, I was unsure okay. if it was a male or female, but I found out afterwards it was female. Um, what was the driver, Mr. Floyd, saying in response to your commands? Um, and he was just like, oh, you know, oh, that's, I'm not, you know, whatever, I, I don't, he was basically not complying, is what I remember, um, I, I don't remember specifically what he was saying. But what did you want him to do with his hands? Put his hands up where I could see him, and then, or, or at the very least, put him on the wheel, and I think I said, put your hands on the wheel. Okay, did he eventually do that? He did. Okay. Yeah. All right, and... So did he, did he try to get out of the car? I think you described yeah. that. he initially was starting to step out of the car. Okay. And, and wh why don't you want him to get out of the car? Well, I don't. Usually if someone's going to get out, they're going to try and run. Okay. Or come at me. I, I don't know. I want to, yeah. at the very least, you know, he's sitting there, keep your hands where I can see him, and then me take control of the situation, take him out, rather than have him step out and face me where you okay. can. Okay. So did he, did he then continue to sit in the car when you told him not to get out? Or did uh, he get out? No, he like kind of stepped a foot out. Mm -hmm. And but then I said, you know, get back, put your foot back in the car, keep your hands where I can see him. Did he obey those commands? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, what's the conversation then at that point? Uh, at that point I was basically, you know, saying, like you're gonna, I'm gonna get you out of the car. Put your hands on top of your head. Um, okay. He, I think he was saying, you know, I got shot like this before or something, and I'm not the guy. So you want now? You want him to get out of the car? Yeah. Now that he's complying, okay. I want to, you know, step him out of the vehicle, detain him, and then go from there and figure out what, you know, what he was sticking under the seat or what he had under the seat. Okay. What about the reason why you're there, though? The counterfeit call. Yeah. Were you going to ask him any questions about try to figure out what was going on with that? Um, I guess at that point, based on his behavior and that he wasn't complying with what I had initially yeah. asked him and was asking him to do, um, I remember he was looking to the right kind of at the keys, and I didn't know if he was going to try and start the car and take off. Okay. Um, so I guess my, my concern was like, all right, we're going to get him out of the car, driver will be secured, I don't have to worry about him taking off. Okay, and so uh, that that handcuffing process. Yep. Um, he's he's initially kind of kind of complying, but then when you ask him to get out and put the handcuffs on, there's a there's a bit of a struggle. Yep. Um, what what is he what is he saying to you when you're trying to handcuff him? Um. And, and, like, what is he doing to prevent you from handcuffing him? Well, he put his, he had his hands initially on his head, and then I asked him, you know, what we were trained is, you grab onto the hands and you step out of the car and face away from me, so they face the door frame. Um, he wasn't really doing that, he didn't want to, he wasn't getting out of the car, so I, I think I grabbed his arm and went to pull him out. And then, um, from there, he was kind of trying to turn around to face me, and that I don't you know again why you turn around to face me but what did you think he was gonna do um, I mean I don't, I'm not sure if he was gonna try and assault me or get away I initially pulled up at the scene and then he tries to get out of the car right away so it's I'm, I'm thinking he might mm -hmm. be trying to get away is it possible he just wanted to talk to you um, at that point I, I I don't think conversation was I, I, uh, I'm not sure. 
Did you tell him he was under arrest at that point? I don't think I did. No. Okay. Was your plan to arrest him at that point, or yeah, or detain, or yeah, okay. detain him? Did you know? I mean, did you know that he was the one? I mean, there's three people in the car. That he was the one that passed the bill. I believe they said it was the driver. Okay. All right. They had, they had indicated the driver. So you wanted to talk to him about what happened. Yeah. All right. So he is eventually handcuffed brought over to the sidewalk mm -hmm. and sits down. Who stays with him? Okay. Okay. Do you know how um, the gentleman was identified? Um, Were you present for that process? No, I was talking to the other two right. people. Um, as we had got him out of the car and handcuffed him, those two exited the vehicle, and I didn't want them going anywhere. And I didn't want them going back too far, so I said, you know, stand up against the wall, Okay. drop the bag, and I ID those two. Do you remember? A name of either of those two? Uh, Sh Shawanda Hill. That was the woman? Yeah. Okay. I don't remember the guy he gave me his ID. I ended up actually taking it with me accidentally. Yeah. So, okay. um, and then just based on the fact that we had two people there and, hit, and Floyd uh, handcuffed, I wanted to get him secured so we could look in the vehicle. Over at, with Officer King, Floyd sitting on the pavement. How is behaving at that point? Um, I mean, he was sitting on the side, and I think he was talking with King. King was trying to ID him. He said, you know, I'm not that type of guy or mm -hmm. something like that. To that was he trying to get up and, like, leave or get I up? I don't believe so. He was no. complying with sit on the, yeah. the sit command? Okay. So, I mean, I guess I'm just trying to understand, like, if he's complying at, at the corner there, You've got two people that you're identifying, and Officer King has clearly got a guy handcuffed sitting. What was the purpose for them putting, needing to put him in the squad car? Couldn't your kind of initial investigation be done, like, right there? Uh, it could, but he was just kind of acting erratically. Um, and like, I, how so? Just the, the way he was yelling, and he was worked up, and um, I guess we would have to have someone sit with him. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I don't know if he was going to try and get up and move around again. So I, my thinking is that I've got two people mm -hmm. here. I've got a car I need to search. Let's get him secured, at least in our car. And then we can get, a, you know, a hard ID on him with the computer and, you okay. know, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and then we can go from there mm -hmm. moving forward. Just trying to understand the thought process Yeah, here. I mean, that, that, that was the basic, you know, this guy's... He seemed like he appeared that he was on drugs, something just based on his agitation level. And, you know, he was saying, like, ah, oh, everything, you know, arms hurt or something. Did you ask him if he was on? I asked him, what yeah. Did he I, was, um, I don't think he I don't think he said anything. What about the other two people? Did they make any comments or statements to you about drug use or anything like that? I don't think so. No. Did you ever ask, did you ask either of them? I think I might have asked them, is he on something? Okay. Yeah, and then the um, the one female said, you know, he's he's crazy, or he got shot like that before too. That's why he's freaking out or something. Okay. Um, because he that's what she said. I guess there was something with a guy with a gun at the car. She said when would would you agree with her assessment that George was freaking out? Yeah. So how are you trained to handle a person who's maybe agitated, under the influence? in some sort of crisis like that. How, how are you, how have you been trained to kind of deal with that? Um, talk to them, I guess, more. Did that happen, in your opinion? Um, I, I would say, I mean, we were trying to explain to him what was going on, that this is where we're at, mm -hmm. this is what happened, you know, you're being detained for this for right now. Was he hearing any of that that you were saying here? Uh, I mean, he, he was pretty erratic at that point. What was his main, I mean, what was, when you walk him to the squad car and, you know, you're trying to get him to sit down, I mean, what is he, is he indicating to you what his main concern is? At he that said, point? I'm not the guy. Okay. I think that's what he kept saying, I'm not the guy, I'm not that kind of guy. Was he asking to just talk to you guys right then and there? Um, I think he was, you know, let me explain, or he might have said that. 
Okay. Did was he given an opportunity just to kind of turn around, keep him handcuffed, and just ex- let him explain what he wants to explain? Um, I think again the the situation that I was kind of explained earlier, the fact that there might have been a weapon in the car. I think my priority was just securing him. Okay. That's kind of where my all right. So, was. did you find a weapon on him? Not when we were searching. Him. Okay. And the part there was a park police officer you said mm-hmm. that arrived, and he was watching the other two in the car. He arrived as we were. Um, or you asked him to do that? I should yeah. Say? Okay. Do you know if he did that? Yeah, I think he walked over there and then just kind of... So the car's empty, and there's two people across the street, and you and your partner have a handcuffed man at your squad car. Mm-hmm. Is the concern still about a weapon, possibly? Um, no. A weapon on his person or in the vehicle? Both. Okay. Well, the weapon in the vehicle is still potentially, yeah, there's a concern for a weapon there. Okay. Um, we had, while we had searched, we, we were searching him, we didn't find a weapon, but there still could be a weapon in the car. Could be. So, all right. Did you search the car at all? We didn't. Okay. How would you normally treat something like that? I mean, you... Why didn't you search the car? Yeah. Uh, we were struggling with restraining Mr. Floyd. Initially. But then he's on the curb sitting against the the wall, right? Next to the vehicle? After you take him out of his vehicle, oh. get him handcuffed, he's now sitting with because, Officer Because, yeah, I didn't want to search a vehicle with two other people that I okay. don't know and then have my partner watch the handcuff. Understood. That, okay. That's putting me at risk and you know, I guess because... Did you ask for backup at all? Uh, I think I had said we're, when we we're getting Mr. Floyd out of the car, I said we're pulling one out, which kind of is okay. a signal to move here, okay, and, and then that's why the park, park responded. Maybe. Okay, yeah. D- does that typical for park police to come yep. help you guys if you need it? Yep. Okay. Um, what kind of pipe did you find? Um, a glass, little pipe like about that big, maybe as big as my ring. Finger, okay. Or what did that indicate to you when you saw it? There wasn't anything in it. Okay. In the end, it had like a cone shape on the end. Like, w- like, what would that pipe be used for in here? Uh, could have been Experience. marijuana, could have been dr- other other drugs other than that. Okay. And Officer King is the one that found that? I believe so, yeah. Do you remember where he found that? Anything? I, I just remember him handing it to me, and then I set it up on top of the squad car. So as you're at the squad car, which side of Mr. Floyd are you on? Left side. Left side, and Officer King, I assume, is on the other? Okay. So it would have been somewhere on his right side that that pipe came from? Yeah. Are you also searching on the left side? Yeah. So you're both searching at the same yeah. time? Yeah. Okay. So, um, this this whole, the whole issue of getting him into the squad car, um, I think the word you used was need. We needed to get him into the squad car. Um, just explain to us kind of your thought process about why you felt it was necessary to put him in the squad car at that point. Again, just to have him secured so I could go back and get an ID on those people, get a hard ID on him. Mm-hmm. Having your squad there is one of the easiest ways to identify people because you have your computer, you can look people's pictures mm-hmm. up, you can look up TBS. Mm-hmm. Um, she didn't give me an ID, she just gave me a name, so mm-hmm. we're going to go back to the squad anyways. Okay, so that would be the most convenient way efficient. to identify, an efficient way to yeah. identify him. Okay. But obviously, he didn't want to get in that car. Yeah. So, is there any? I mean, did you ever think about maybe a different way to handle this, other than just putting him in the car? Did you Officer King discuss that at the scene about, hey, maybe we should just sit him on the curb again? No. Okay. Um, so, two other officers from the Minneapolis Police Department arrive. Mm-hmm. Who are they? Uh, Officer Chauvin and Tao. Tao. Okay. And you, you mentioned earlier that you worked with Officer Chauvin before. Mm-hmm. What about Officer Tao? Do you have you any experience with him? Not a whole lot. He worked in the precinct too, but I didn't really see him on that many calls. Are Chauvin and, well, just in the limited experience you had, are Chauvin and Tao typically partners that you know of? Um, no. I, I mean... You don't know or just... I don't think I've seen okay. them roll together typically. I guess I don't even know what 
Sheldon's typical district is. Okay. Just because he was always training, so he was moving around. Um, so as as you're trying to get Mr. Floyd in the car, you mentioned that you're pulling from the other side. Is somebody with you at that time helping you do that? I think that's when Officer Chauvin came around because they arrived um, and he was refusing to get in that side. So I went around and was going to grab um, his arm to help pull him, just pull him through the squad uh -huh. to get him in so he could secure him. Just describe describe Mr. Floyd to me. What what was he wearing, for example? Uh, he had like sweatpants on with the uh, gym shorts underneath, and then I believe it was a black or gray um, tank top. Okay. Um, he had kind of white spots on either side of his mouth. Um, he was yelling, mm -hmm. kind of just agitated. Um, he said, you know, like his arms and everything. He's very sensitive to stuff, uh, which is common with people, at least in the limited experience I have with drug use and people okay. that are um, coming off drugs or yeah. are frequent drug users. They're very hypersensitive to okay. stuff. So. Um, how about physically? What did, what did he look like? Uh, he's almost as tall as me, muscular. How, um, how tall are you? I'm six foot seven. Six seven. About the same height as you? Yeah. Maybe? Okay. Um, so, as you and Officer Chauvin are trying to pull him into the squad car, what what is Floyd yelling, I suppose, at that point, saying? Um, he had mentioned, he had said that he was claustrophobic, yeah. and I had said, I'll stay with you. Uh, when we were on the other side of the car, I said, I'll stay with you, I'll put the windows down, I'll put the air on, mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah, I think he kind of agreed to that, but then went back again, well, I'm not, no, I don't want to get in, and it was just kind of all over the place. Yeah. Um, so back on the other side, he was just saying no, um, and then kind of started, once I pulled him over the lip of the door, he kind of started to thrash around. And so he was in the back seat, but not in enough that you could... Close the, close the door. Okay, yeah. so then the decision was made to just pull him all the way through? Is that... I was going to go around. No, he was basically sitting. He wasn't even in the squad. He was sitting on the edge on yeah. the other side. On the on the driver's side? Yeah. Okay. And refusing to go in. And then I went around the other side and was just going to pull him in. Okay. So how did he end up on the ground on the passenger side? On the other side, um, once I pulled him in and he got into the seat, um, he kind of started thrashing around and I think he banged his head multiple times on the, like I said, the glass. Uh, and then he kind of pushed, he used his feet, I believe, to okay. push because I just remember, like, he came out so like... So he pushed himself out of the car? Yeah. Versus as as you the, guys pulling him out of the car? Is that... Yeah, because the goal was to keep him in yeah. the car. Okay. That was, we didn't want him coming out again. We were going to pull him through and then just secure him. Okay, so then who, who made the decision of to put him or to put him on the ground like that and just leave him there. Um, someone had said something, let's just bring him to the ground because he was continuing to fight. Okay. When he goes on the ground, does anything change? Like, does his compliance level change at any point? No, he started, well, what do you mean by that? So, he obviously didn't want to get in the car and he's yeah. fighting you to get in the car. Once he's on the ground, is he continuing to fight? Yeah. He was still, like, kicking and um, kicking at me, and then I think I had said, you know, let's get the hobble to secure his legs, because okay. I was on holding his legs. Who got the hobble? I think it was Tao. Or Mo, or it was okay, so what you're... His name again? Tao. Officer Tao. Tao, yeah. yeah. So you're holding his... Legs. The George's legs. Yes. And who's next to you? Officer Kim. And what is he doing? He, he was... I guess holding his arms, I don't know, or his hand, or had maybe in a, a cradle. Is he handcuffed? Yeah. Okay. I'm and sure. then who's next? Officer Chauvin. All right. And what are you seeing Officer Chauvin doing from where you're at? Uh, he was just pinning him down. Pinning him how? Uh, he had his knee up around, yeah, the shoulders and neck area. Okay. Is that a technique that you've seen before? No. Have you been trained in that at all? No. Put your knee on somebody's back or neck area. Like on the back, yeah. On the back, yeah. Tell, yeah. tell us about that one. Uh, just when you're handcuffing and restraining someone, that you can run your, you know, I mean, I want me to sit and show you, but you can run your knee up across their back, 
their shoulder blade in between the shoulder blades mm -hmm. um, or yeah across you know across this way around the shoulders okay so it's handcuffing um, handcuffing as a technique something that you learned at the academy mm -hmm. okay and are there different ways you can handcuff somebody mm -hmm. what what this express what you can uh, standing handcuff. kneeling yeah. prone okay so you obviously handcuffed this guy, this uh, Floyd, while he was standing. Mm -hmm. um, he's prone mm -hmm. at this point. Um, so would that knee technique, or that would that really apply at this point since he's already handcuffed? Um, I guess the plan for there was basically just to restrain him so he couldn't move and hurt okay. himself anymore. Because like I said, he started banging his head on the glass when we got in the car he was bleeding and he head. started bleeding so he was just kind of we're like I, I don't know if he's gonna so the, the plan was just to get him so he couldn't move anymore or hurt mm -hmm. himself or hurt us so what who who made the decision to start EMS I think I had said that initially I said he's bleeding from the mouth we should start an ambulance okay for the bleeding from the mouth yeah okay and as you're waiting for paramedics to come, I mean, is that the whole goal with him on yeah. the ground, just to wait for paramedics? Yeah, we'll just wait and they'll probably, they, you know, would do a hold on him or something since he's just kind of out of control. So was there more to calling the paramedics than just checking his mouth? Um, like, initially, I think that that's what I said we should do it for. But then someone else, I'm not sure, I don't remember, said, you know, let's just step it up to code three. I think after... But what can the paramedics do to help you guys with a, a, a kind of an uncontrolled, non-compliant person? You know, like, what what are they going to be able to do by getting their code three if he has a mouth injury, but he's also non-compliant? Well, I think that I had mentioned that, you know, this could be possibly excited delirium or something. Okay, so, so let's... That was the other thing for stepping it up, because he might be in medical distress. And you articulated that? Yeah. Okay, and that, well, how was that suggestion received by your partners? Um, they, no one, yeah, they said just, this is fine. We're Who's going to said that? Yeah. Chauvin said, this is, we're just going to hold him here until EMS arrives. So, and I had suggested, you know, with excited delirium, you know, maybe we should roll him on his side just to, you know, if he's, like, I mm -hmm. think it's something I had previously learned at, uh, previous job where he roll on the side to a recovery position or something like that. So. Okay. What previous job did you have? I think it was GDC. Did you work at a general yep. detention center? At Hennepin County? Mm -hmm. How long did you work there? About a year and a half. Is that post-college or? Post-college, sure. Okay. So have you experienced in the field excited delirium or suspected excited delirium? Um, no, not ex excited delirium necessarily, okay. but, um, just an incident where someone was very excited and ended up. Do you, do you have a, a recollection uh, in your academy days or even prior to that learning about excited delirium? I think there was a class on it. Okay. Did they, I mean, you you obviously bring it up, so it's mm -hmm. clearly it's something you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, what prevented you from just kind of taking charge of that and, and, and making the call? Um, I, I was basically going off Officer Chauvin's experience and what he was saying, like, this is, we're going to hold here until EMS arrives. Is he a supervisor? He's not. Okay. Was he in any sort of supervisory capacity that night? Like no. an acting supervisor or something like that? No. He just has more years on? That you He's 20 obviously. years on, so I, I, I mean, basically through the whole FTO process, you trust and go to your senior officers for experience and... Okay. Help on calls and what's the best thing to do in this situation. They give you direction and okay. kind of you follow their lead on how what you think is. But it seems like your gut reaction was something's not right here and we need to rethink how we are restraining Mr. Floyd. Is that accurate? That's what it seems like you're saying. Yeah. I would say I, I felt like it maybe could have been handled differently or it should be reassessing what we're doing, I think is what I was kind of coming to. Okay. Um, is Mr. Floyd's 
um, disposition changing over time as you were holding him there? Yeah. How so? Uh, he was actively fighting us in the initially, uh, and then he just kind of was talking for a while, and it, you know, um, he saying stuff that you know he couldn't breathe and that his back hurt and. Um, Did you hear him say that? I can't breathe. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Did you hear him say that his neck hurt? Um, I don't specifically remember no? that. Okay. But... Could you see where Officer Chauvin's knee was placed? Yes. Where? Um, like I said, it was along the back or the neck area, the bottom of the base of the neck. Okay. So it was on the upper back at the base of the neck from your perspective? Mm hmm Okay. Um... And because Officer Chauvin said, no, we'll leave him here, that's what just what happened. Is that what you said, we'll leave him here? Or we'll leave him in this position, or? Um, he had said, we have an ambulance coming, let's just hold here. You know, you have the ambulance coming. Did you, okay. Were you getting a sense that Mr. Floyd was having a medical emergency? Um, I mean, obviously I, I was, hindsight, but at the time. I, I, yeah, I felt maybe that something was going on. Okay. Um, but you thought he was passing out? Yeah. Okay. Were you, I mean, what were you, what were you feeling at that point? I was just monitoring and making sure that he was still breathing and that okay. kind of just, I was, like I said, intently looking and making sure that, the, that he was still breathing. And um, there's a crowd gathering, is that right? Mm -hmm. Can you hear what they're yelling and saying to you guys? Like what? What are they saying? Someone was saying, "Get off him!" You know, um, he's handcuffed. You know, he's not fighting you guys. Mm -hmm. Is that all true? What is what, what they're saying? He's handcuffed. He's not fighting you. Oh, well, he was fighting him. Yeah, he. I mean, he well, was. at that moment though, when they're saying that, was he? They've been saying I know he a was. lot of stuff. You're, I mean, yeah. they're talking different timelines. Okay. When. Did, did you hear anybody in the crowd express to you that he's not breathing? Um, I think somebody says unresponsive, I think is the word. I think, yeah. I, I, I don't specifically remember saying someone, someone saying he's not breathing. Okay. So when the paramedics get there, describe Mr. Floyd's actions at that point. Um... He was basically, yeah, non-responsive, and I think the EMS came over and attempted to um, check for a pulse, and I think I had said, you know, he's not responsive right now. I had said something, basically. Did just, you think he was maybe dead at that point, or no? I, I mean, I don't know. I don't okay. think so. So he gets, what happens then when the paramedics get here? Um, are you guys still holding him down, or at some point do you let go? Then I let go once paramedics yeah, were there. Okay. And then they checked, and then right. uh, they got the cart out. Okay. What? How was he put on the cart? Uh, we rolled him over under the, the back. What observations did you make of him when he was rolled over? If um, any. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Did you help put him on the yeah. stretcher? Okay. And then you go into the ambulance with him. Yeah. What What are you observing of him as he's in the ambulance? Uh, Non-responsive again, and I think I took a pulse on him. Um, I couldn't find one. Um, EMS, the EMS guy said, you know, start CPR. Start doing compression. Ch chest compressions. And yeah. you did that? Yeah. Okay. Um, have you done chest compressions before? On a person? Yeah. No. That was your first time? Yeah. Have you been trained to do that? Mm -hmm. w where did you receive that training? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you? Do you have a certain certification, like first responder, EMT, anything like that? Um, we're CPR certified and. Perfect. Okay. So you have that basic. Yeah. CPR certification. Right. Um, did the paramedics ask you to tell you tell them kind of what happened? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you. Was your body camera on this whole time? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you give them kind of a rundown of what yeah. really occurred? Okay. Um, after the firefighters get on 
the rig and you kind of get off the rig, where do you go? Well, I wasn't 100% sure where we are, so I went yeah. and looked. And okay. then um, radioed, I was going to see if my partner could come down and pick me up because I they were going to work on him. Do you remember where you were? I don't. At the intersection? Okay. Did your partner come get you or what happened? Uh, I ended up getting a ride with the fire department. I was waiting with them and they said that you know he's going to go down to the hospital. Um, I went and said, do you guys want me to ride with you? Mm -hmm. And they said no. So then the fire, whoever's driving the fire truck said, we're going to be going back there. We need to be right. Okay. Did you have a discussion with the firefighters on the fire truck about what happened? Uh, I basically, I think, gave them a, a rundown to what happened. In as much detail as you did today, or was it just kind of a... No, it was just, okay. you know, we went to this. Yeah. We were fighting. Got him out of the car, you know. Went here. You didn't want to get in. Did um, at some point did you deactivate your body camera? Uh, when we were going back. On the fire. Yep. Okay. And then did you re reactivate it? You talked about talking to the sergeant. Yeah. So like I guess we went back and um, the other people were gone, and so there was you know nothing going on there. <coughs> so who who was the sergeant that you first talked to? Pluger. Pluger? I think so. Okay. Have you ever worked with him before? Or? Yeah. Okay. He's a midwife sergeant. All right. Who all was there talking to Sergeant Pluger? Was it just you or was it No, everybody? I think it was me and King and Chauvin and Powell probably as well. Okay. And so what did Sergeant Pluger want to know? Just what happened and where, okay. what was going on. And did you tell him mm -hmm. what happened? Did anybody else? I think King did as well. Okay. Even kind of a unknown. Did you tell anybody about what you observed on the ambulance? About his condition or um, how it appeared? I don't think I did at that point. He said he was going to be driving down to the hospital okay. just to check. Okay. Kluger said that he was. He goes, I'm going down there right now. So it's like, okay. Okay. Did you think he was maybe dead? Um, I was concerned about it at mm -hmm. that point when we got into the ambulance. Did you tell the sergeant that? I didn't. Okay. And then after the sergeant leaves, then what's discussed amongst the four of you? I think it was just what what we're going to do. We need to sit on the car. And um, I think Chauvin said he was going to go down to the hospital as well. Okay. And then me and King were just going to sit and wait on the car from there until we you know, knew what was going on. Okay. Do you know whose car that was? I, it was our car. Was oh, you're talking about sitting on your your squad car. Oh yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Or well, there's the car that we had pulled them out of. Yeah, that car. That car, yeah. Whose car is that? I, I don't know. Okay. Didn't get to that. No. Did you ever run the plate as you're sitting there? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and then, who was it that suggested that you try to find witnesses? Um, I think either Pluger and maybe Sergeant Edwards said that. Witnesses to what, though? To the counterfeit thing? Or the incident with Mr. Floyd? I think the incident both? with Mr. Floyd. Okay. They were saying just see if you can get people's names that were here. Okay. And then Sergeant Edwards, who's, who is he? Sergeant. Is it, like, dog watch third sergeant. precinct? Yeah, third okay. precinct dog watch sergeant. So he came then to the scene? Mm -hmm. And what did he instruct you guys to do? He said start coordinating the, the area off. Did you tell Sergeant Edwards what had happened? Did he ask what, what happened? I think he asked for just maybe a quick rundown and okay. the same kind of thing. All right. Okay. Um, do you remember the name of the who escorted you down to the Uh It was a second precinct sergeant. Okay. He was very nice. I don't remember All right. Now, during all this time, you've had your body cameras on? Mm -hmm. All right. Did you and um, Officer King ever discuss kind of what happened off body camera while um, you were waiting around? I think we had just said, you know, I was like, I, I think I had said I hope he's okay, and um, there wasn't really much of a conversation, though. No? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the, the sergeant driving you down to City Hall, he didn't ask you any questions about what happened? No. Did you give a statement to anybody at the police department? Um, right. No, not, I just, there was an attorney there. Okay, yeah. You talked to an attorney? Yeah, Okay. I don't think I gave it a I statement mean, to me. I mean, when I, anybody from the Minneapolis Police Department? No. Any administrator, 
internal affairs, no. detectives, no. no. There were, well, there was a sergeant, or Lieutenant Zimmerman, showed up to the scene and he kind of, same thing, wanted to know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I think I gave him, and there was another guy, I don't remember his name. Who's Lieutenant Zimmerman? Um, he's an investigator. Okay. Yeah. So is he in a uniform or? He was in, well, they always wear yeah. just their little suits and long coats. Is he homicide? Uh, yeah. Lieutenant? Okay. Um, what was the purpose of your, I mean, like, what was the interaction with him? Just wanted to say what happened. What's just told him kind of what yeah. happened? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so watching the body camera video um, prior to today, that happened in your squad car? Yeah, I just watched through it one more time, or for the first time, just to kind of go over everything. Okay. And as far as you know, at, at that time, that was within your policy to do that? Like, you could watch those videos like that? Yeah, as okay. far as I know, I mean... To help you, like, write reports and things? Yeah, or what? I mean, okay. you can watch body cam your own video whenever you want. Right yeah. There. How, like, how do you physically do that? Because the camera just... on just, your phones. Oh, okay. Yeah. City issue phone? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, was Officer King present mm -hmm. with you when you watched? Did you guys watch it together? Mm hmm Okay. All right. Is it okay if I ask yeah. a question? Mm -hmm. Um, did you... You were one of the officers that walked into Cup Foods um, for the counterfeit. Did you? Yes, yes, yes. Oh yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, when you walked in, did the employee explain to you why they believed the money was counterfeit? No. Okay. And as far as you know, you didn't take custody of that counterfeit no. money. Um, when. And I know I'm going to jump around a little bit because Brent's asked you <laughs> yeah. a lot of very detailed questions. Have you ever had, um, in your experience as an officer, somebody resist arrest? Um, briefly, yeah. Okay. I would say not to that level. So would it be fair to say, well, I guess I should ask this. When you were in the academy, did they walk you through if someone were to resist yeah. arrest? And what was the general training for that? Gain control of the person and detain them. Okay. Um, I mean, this, that's yeah, kind of a generalized question of how you resist, but I mean. Right. Um, are you taught to take, I should ask this, are you taught to take somebody down to the ground in a prone position on their stomach? Yeah. Okay, you've been taught that when they're handcuffed. I mean, it depends on the situation. Okay. And then the restraint hold, I know that you talked about um, where Chavin was. Where were you, Well, On his legs. Holding his legs yeah. down? Okay, the entire time? Yeah. Okay. Um, we talked about when we started kind of what's on your duty belt. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to describe, I know you have handcuffs and you have um, a handgun. Do you have any other... Um, tools on your belt. Mm -hmm. Can you explain those to me? And then as um, I'm just going to have to ask you yes. answer yes or no yes. <laughs> so we don't just get affirmative pluses on a transcript. Um, can you describe your duty belt to me? Um, my specific layout? or Yes, please. Sure. So I have uh, mace on the front center uh, going to the right around towards my right side is handcuffs, my duty weapon, behind that is another set of handcuffs, um, starting from the left center is, uh, oh, it's my magazine pouch, the two magazines, um, my taser, my radio, and my flashlight. Okay. And are you taser trained? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. yes. Sorry. Um, when Mr. Um, Floyd was removed from his vehicle, who was present when he came out of the vehicle? Uh, myself and Officer King. And who placed handcuffs on him? Both of us. Okay. And what was located during the search of, or was there anything located during the search of um, Mr. Floyd? There was the pipe that um, Officer King had found that, that was back at the squad, though, our squad. Right. Is, was there anything else, as far as you know? No. 
ID, wallet, additional money. No. Not that you're aware of. Not that I'm aware of, yeah. Did you ever check for a pulse yourself on Mr. Floyd? Um, I think I might have on his leg, but then I think I'd said maybe to King at that point, you know, see if you can find something up there, just double check. I know that you mentioned um, your previous one previous job. What did you do before becoming a police officer? Which, before JDC? Yep. Uh, before that, I worked at a residential treatment facility for Ramsey County for at-risk youth. It's a voice tone tone. Okay. And so when we talk about um, describing, because you mentioned a few times that you felt he may have been under the influence. Mm -hmm. Do you have... Yes. Do you have experience um, in recognizing those signs? Yes. So could you describe, I guess I should say, in, in more specific detail, what what indicated to you that Mr. Floyd may have been under the influence? Uh, his body language, the way he moved, his head and his neck, it was just he, kind of the, the restless and constant movement um, is, is a sign that I recognize from drug use that there's always something moving. Um, um, that, like I said, the, the hypersensitivity, you know, when I just grabbed his arm, he was like, oh, you know, the very sensitive to things is, as far as I've felt, you know, a very common thing for people that are coming down off drugs or on drugs, that their senses are very, um, you know, sensitive. Okay. And, um, and then the dry mouth, he had very dry mouth and the kind of accumulated spit on either side of his mouth is another common thing for drug use. Okay. Um... When was, I should ask, when was he hand, unhandcuffed? Did you ever unhand? In the uh, ambulance. Okay, and when did that occur? Uh, that was, I think, as soon as he got loaded into the ambulance, then the EM, uh, EMS guy, you know, checked for pulse and figured out what, you know, I said, then we're taking, he, he took the cuffs off. He took the cuffs yeah. off and handed them back to you? Yeah. Okay. And um, did you talk to, I know um, Brent asked you about viewing the video and, um, talking to Officer King generally. Have you talked to any of the other officers involved? No. About this? No. Uh, the night that um, this incident happened, you were brought downtown. Your mm -hmm. clothing was collected mm -hmm. um, by us. Were you offered blood? Yeah. And I think they offered to, they said it's a voluntary to go do blood work. And um, just with the COVID-19 thing, I didn't really want to go down to the hospital. Okay, so that... Uh, that would be my follow-up. Was there a reason for yeah, declining? basically that. I try and avoid the hospital when I can and okay. with everything that's going on now. Mm -hmm. What are your general thoughts about this? Where, yeah, that's a uh, weird... I mean, about what? About all of it. There's a lot going mm -hmm. on. I mean, do you think this was appropriate? I know. He wouldn't have done it if he didn't think it was appropriate. As far as what he did, I think that's it. We're not going to answer that unless you want to. Um, just so it's clear, you said she asked you if you talked to any of the other officers um, since then. Before you went to room 100, mm -hmm. but after you've been on the ambulance, there's kind of this period, time period, where you're just kind of at the scene. Did you have any conversation with Officer Chauvin at that point? Did he call, give you an update about status of the guy at the hospital, or did you ask him a question or anything like that? Uh, no, I don't have his number, so there was no phone call. Like the work work phone to work phone? You didn't no, call I don't. Okay. I don't have his work number. You didn't have that in your in your phone. Yeah. Okay. Kind of what's. Okay. And either this was either at the academy or FTO or a combination of the two since that's kind of been your experience so far. What's kind of the understanding or practice when interacting as a rookie officer with a senior officer? And I'm not talking about a supervisor, but just a, a senior patrol officer. I mean, is there, the reason I'm asking, I noticed you, you, you called him sir, I think, on the video. Like, mm -hmm. How come? That's just kind of the expectation for a new officer to call any senior officer sir. And that's just what's expected. That's what you're taught and trained to do? Uh, at what point do you stop doing that, I guess? 
um, after you have maybe more than a year on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you go through the formal 40-hour CIT class at the academy? Um, there was a lot of training on that I would have to check. That one's, I mean, that's pretty memorable training because they we usually bring in actors and you run through scenarios and things oh. like that. Did you do that? I remember, yeah, I remember there was one where there was a scenario, yeah, the actress came in. Was that just like a one-day deal or was it I don't know eight? if it was 40 hours. Okay. I, I think there's the minimum eight hour standard. Yeah, that it could have been where yeah. they had actors come in and you yeah. know, try and you went through them, that yeah. minimum one. Okay. Yeah. What other classes in de-escalation have you had? Um, I know I asked you this before, but I, I want I, I want to make sure I understand. Scenarios. Yeah. Was one of the bigger ones where we would crisis uh, intervention and scenarios. Speakers come in and talk to you about. No, or you have or a scenario that. Um, you know, someone is mm -hmm. in crisis and you talk them through the situation. Okay. Okay. Did you have, like, a class on recognize, like, uh, some sort of professional would come in and tell you to, or, you know, what to recognize signs of people in crisis or under the influence or sure. mental illness? Okay. Cover a lot of ground at the academy. Yeah. Right. How did you first learn of uh, Mr. Floyd's death? Um, I think it was down at 108, um, or, yeah, I mean, honestly, it was kind of a blur, I, uh, you guys are asking, like, really specific questions about, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, you don't remember, you don't remember, I don't remember, yeah, I don't specifically, nothing wrong with that, I don't specifically remember when. Do you believe you contributed to Mr. Floyd's death? That's a... I object to that, you're not going to answer that. Do you believe uh, Chauvin contributed to Same his death? Same objection. I'm not answering that. Any other? Is there anything else you think that we should know that we haven't asked you? And if there is, I couldn't think of it. If, um, if you do, Sure. Please let us know. Um, I will um, let you guys work this way, but do you have anything else, Brent, before I, I should have asked? I'm sorry. Do you no, that's okay. I'm just, uh, I want to make sure um, that I understand everything here. Um, so when it comes to offering opinions about things, we're not going to go there, it sounds like. Well, yes, that. because it's, it's a criminal investigation. If he commit a crime, that's why we're here, and our sure. opinions about him, <clears throat> what, he, what his thought process is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you could sit back and say, yeah, maybe I did something wrong 20, 20 days ago or something, but yeah, I, it's not, I don't think that's a fair question. Okay. <clears throat> he, Understood. So I have lots ahead. of questions, but as we, previous, okay, as we previously discussed, Mm -hmm. uh, not going to answer any questions, and if I if I was to ask questions, the interview today could have been terminated, or I could have been asked to leave. Would that be a fair statement? Of what what we was that? If I if I was to ask questions, you may have terminated have the interview or asked me to leave at some point. I don't care if you stayed there. I just would, okay. We're not, we okay. agreed to be interviewed by the BCA, not FBI. <clears throat> Well, and the reason it wasn't the FBI is because your investigation is substantially different than their investigation. Their investigation deals with the facts, and you're dealing with civil rights and all of that stuff, and we're not prepared for that. Okay, understood. But, however, if you do have some questions, Mr. Paulson can send them to me, or you can send them to me. All right. And I can look at them, and if I feel they're fair, we'll answer them. Fair enough. Thank you. Is there anything else you think we should know that we haven't asked you? No, okay. Right. Uh, Mr. Grazer, anything you think we should get on the record that we haven't? <clears throat> well, we see in the video. Um, and by the video, you mean the public video or the body no, we, camera? the one we just saw. Uh-huh. The body camera video. <clears throat> you know, I guess it speaks for itself. I mean, he, he's the one that... Um, was trying to interject his ability to roll him over or 
things of that nature. I think he might be suffering from something. And he got a 20-year veteran, and he's a four or five day veteran, no matter what. Um, and he has to call the guy, sir. Um, is this recorded? Yeah. Oh, I better show. Anyway, I, I can't, you know, I mean, I, I have a hard time with the police department putting two guys four or five days experience together <clears throat> for not putting him with a veteran cop and a rookie cop for at least long enough to, to be very experienced. It would be like a lawyer trying his first case without any help from any of the other lawyers that have tried cases. Every incident's different. So, and he, you know, he's got to worked hard to become a cop. He was a totem town fellow. He went through all the training. Worked at the juvenile center, which I'm sure is not a fun job. And he got his dream job as a police. Huh? Tried to have fun with it and. It's a hard job working with juveniles. Can, can I ask a question about sure. that? Sure. I mean, do you, do you feel that you were adequately trained at the Minneapolis Police Department? I don't think that's a fair question. I can give those opinions, but he... he well, he's, he's not, experienced, you know... I know he has, but that's, that's, why not, I'm that's, not, for this, that's okay. not for this litigation. All I can do is ask. <laughs> you don't have to answer. Okay. I mean, I, you don't know, want to talk about, is it fair to fire him immediately like that? I think. I, I didn't see Shaman get fired. Did he get fired? Yeah, he did. I have no... Um, but he's got the appeal. Okay. Where my client is fired. He doesn't have a job. Being on probation. He's not on probation. No, no, I mean, yeah. he's a probationary officer at the time. Yeah. Correct. Under a year? Yeah. Okay. All right. Understood. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Time is 1450.